just in case you want to know who I am, there I am. Uh, and um, there is a, a book that in a way is connected with some of the things that I'll be saying today. Uh, and uh, let me first thank James Hughes for inviting me uh, to this conference. Uh, and uh, the co-author of the book mentioned here, Veronica Lipinska, is also in the audience. Uh, and uh, let me start by saying the following, namely, when I heard that, and when I read that this was a, uh, a conference on non-human personhood, uh, to be honest with you, animals weren't the first thing that came to my mind. Machines were, okay? Um, and, and I do think, uh, and, and that most of the people uh, to whom uh, I address the kinds of things that I'm talking about, um, actually, I think, would think the same way as well. And often at conferences, and I think Veronica can testify to this, I actually have to remind people that um, there is this other side of the post-human condition that is actually concerned with animals rather than with our merging with machines. Okay? And I do think, to a certain extent, these two worlds exist pretty independently of each other. And certainly from the things I've been hearing here in the last couple of days, it certainly suggests that. And so, in a way, that's kind of the backdrop. Um, you have a problem? Oh. <laughs> um, and the, the context that I'm coming from here that, that in a way puts me in the discussions that we're, we've been having for the last couple of days is I think if you look at it from the long historical standpoint, the category of human is not very stable at all. Okay, so people who think that there's some kind of paradigm case that the human is the basis for personhood and rights and all the other things and, and then we just sort of extend it outward to other creatures if we want to, um, I think that's not uh, very clear at all because uh, never uh, throughout the history um, of law until perhaps the drafting of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights was there any really serious consideration that all homo sapiens would be considered as legal persons in the, in the sense that's being contested here at this conference, okay? Uh, I mean, homo sapiens typically were seen as eligible for being human. No, but that's an important point, eligible and maybe the primary candidates, uh, but not necessarily automatically inducted into that legal category. Okay, uh, and, and, that's, and, and, and this is where the distinction between things like sentience, you know, and autonomy start to matter in this whole discussion. And I think that's worth, worth keeping in mind here because um, the idea that somehow all homo sapiens are eligible to count as humans um, uh, is, is one that really only the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights makes really crystal clear. Uh, of course, there are the kinds of things that we normally think about when we think about human rights um, are the sorts of rights that are inscribed in civil rights, right? And civil rights being the rights of citizens in particular countries, okay? And if you look at things like the Bill of Rights in the United States, for example, uh, and those rights are enumerated, they have to do uh, with the rights of citizens typically vis-a-vis -vis other citizens and the state, Okay, um, and there isn't a whole lot of reference being made to intrinsic properties of people by virtue of which they hold those things. Now, of course, there is a lot of talk of that kind, but that talk exists in a somewhat independent sphere. Okay, and we might talk about that kind of talk. You know, all human beings are endowed by the creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That kind of stuff you see in the Declaration of Independence in the United States. Right, that's more natural law talk. Right? But what actually follows from that, from the standpoint of civil rights, is a very open question. Okay? Uh, and in a sense, uh, what the UN, UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights does is to kind of amalgamate these two things in a way that wasn't actually all that clear beforehand. Because even though uh, you know, countries like the United States and other, uh, and other uh, you know, Republican democracies in particular have had very articulated rights, they've typically been for its citizens. Right? And those are typically only a subset of even the human beings living in the societies. Okay? Um, and under those circumstances, natural law often could be invoked, you might say, as a sort of second order principle to stop the worst excesses to the humans who aren't included in that category. Right? And that's how it usually got used in the law. But natural law wasn't going to give you by itself everything you want either. Because in the natural law tradition, you know, and you think about where it's had the, the most purchase, you know, within the Catholic countries, for example, and so forth, uh, there aren't the kinds of things that actually uh, the civil rights in Republican democracies have tried to guarantee, especially with regard to uh, at least formal equality among people. Okay, those kinds of ideas that we associate with modern democracies. Natural law, of course, believes in respecting the dignity 
of all human beings by virtue of being human, but what that amounts to in practice could vary widely in terms of what exactly each person's entitled to. Okay, uh, so for example, natural law theory in a way is completely comfortable, in principle at least, with the idea that you could have kings and serfs and, and, and so forth, uh, and as long as the, uh, the serfs were treated properly and weren't being tortured or treated cruelly, they didn't need formal equality with the king, right? It's only when, when you went beyond a certain level and you treated them so that they were devoid of their dignity that then revolution was justified. But that wasn't licensed to have formal equality. Right? That was a license to restore what was regarded as the normative status quo, which implies that everybody has their place. Right? That's natural law theory in its kind of pure form, the way Thomas Aquinas believed in it, and the way in which uh, it justified, actually, revolution up to the time of the 18th century when John Locke started to change the game. Okay? So I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind here. Now, by the, now when you get into 1948 with the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right, we, we bring up this very interesting kind of hybrid figure who, in a sense, in a very, I, I think, masterful way, but in a way I think people don't quite realize just how hybrid it is, um, is the uh, Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain. Okay? He is the philosopher who's probably most influential with regard to the drafting of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and with regard to Europe, as you know, Europe has taken the lead through the European Union and so forth in championing uh, the, the idea of human rights um, and um, through the Christian democratic parties of Europe after World War II, right, which was the main party certainly in Germany after World War II. And I think, uh, you know, certainly along, you know, was, has been one of the main two parties across Western Europe in the post-war era. Um, and here what you end up getting is, is the following, right? Um, you basically get kind of the Republican democracy notion of citizenship rights now extended to all human beings by virtue of being human in a way in which Republican democracies did not necessarily do beforehand, certainly not the United States, for example, okay? Um, and, um, and, and, the, and it's in that context then that we start to think about each individual is entitled to dignity, entitled to certain kinds of rights and so forth within homo sapiens. And this is something that in a way seems to be directed at the states, but is something that needs to be maintained ultimately at the international level. It's not something that, as it were, gets appealed to in the breach, as in the case of natural law theory, but rather it's something that should be operating actively all the time and that you could bring up violators on a regular basis, which is kind of what happens in the European Union, for example. Right, when they're violators of various kinds of human rights provisions in the uh, member state countries, right, the uh, European Union swoops down on you. It happens in Britain all the time. Um, and, and so th but this is a kind of very unique arrangement, all right? Um, and, and, it, in, and it involves a certain kind of notion of, of, the, uh, of what it is to be a human being that when you read it is, is really, well, it's tricky. It's tricky actually to, to enforce in practice because it goes way beyond uh, just protecting the security of the individual. It actually talks about act promotion, active promotion of individuals in society. Okay, and, and uh, this is something that you know, Republican democracies have talked about trying to do and so forth, and it's quite clear that what Maritain had in mind was a kind of secular version of the Christian idea of the human being now applied to Republican democracy within the context of a welfare state. Okay, that is kind of what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you really wanted to work around the world, that's kind of what you would end up getting, okay? Um, and that's a pretty difficult proposition, right, to be able to enforce at that kind of level. Um, now, but if you pull back from that, right, and you look at the way in which uh, actual members of Homo sapiens have been treated uh, within various countries and so forth, even ones with strong civil rights tradition, there isn't this, as it were, unique privileging of all homo sapiens that often seems to be presupposed in this argument. There's always been a fight everywhere because in a sense, being a homo sapiens isn't what's at issue here, right? The biological stuff isn't really the issue, okay? The issue has to do with having certain kinds of properties and this is where actually things like rationality and autonomy and all those things that people seem to want to put to one side in the animal rights movement actually is quite important because that's the thing that entitles you to rights because it then means that you can live in a way the kind of existence, and I think actually Laurie Marino, when, when she was focusing on the business of mental time travel, 
I think in a way that's kind of the core idea of autonomy here. The idea to set long-term life plans where you can achieve something. And, and, and the autonomy lies in the fact that you're not just derailed all the time or prevented from all the time, but you have it within yourself the wherewithal to realize those life plans. And that's the difference between being autonomous and what Kant called heteronymous, where you're just pushed around by your passions. Right? The heteronymous being has loads of interests and is constantly being pulled apart by them. That's why when somebody says right, uh, that all you need to have is a bundle of interests in order to be entitled to rights, they say, no, no, no. Right? I mean, because there's a sense in which that doesn't guarantee you autonomy. Autonomy, in a way, has to do with prioritizing your interests, being able to make plans to realize them to varying degrees, and to resist all the temptations against them. Okay? Uh, and this kind of model, right, of the person, which Homo sapiens is eligible to be, but not all of them necessarily are, is ultimately a theological notion, right? And the resistance from temptation and so forth is a kind of hint uh, at that, right? That there is a sense in which, um, you know, if it, you know to, to, because in republican democracies, where the ideas of civil rights were most strongly uh, uh, developed, right? The presupposition of the person in, the, in those societies was one was ones who stood up against the king, stood up for themselves, right? And then voluntarily associated with each other because they believed they were stronger together, right? But at the end of the day, took decisions for themselves and were willing to live in a state of sustained conflict with each other, right? And if you think about the Constitution of the United States, the checks and balances, separations of power, right? That is the, in a way, the epitome of that kind of understanding of a society. And it presupposes autonomous individuals interacting with each other, okay? And here in, in this regard, I thought it was very telling yesterday that when Stephen Wise was giving his, uh, you know, rather homely and pleasant presentation, he made a remark about the concept of right that he was deriving on. He almost said it under his breath. But I do think that for those of you who are interested in this matter, right, Wesley Hofeld, um, uh, who is one of the leading theorists of jurisprudence in the early 20th century, um, actually uh, did a very, a very important fourfold analysis of right. Uh, and and, and the, the, of that fourfold analysis, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, the distinction that's relevant to what Wise was talking about was the difference between the immunity right and the claim right. right? He mentioned that yesterday very briefly in passing, and that's a really important distinction. Because the animals have the immunity right. Uh, that, that is to say uh, that they can, uh, that, that you can prevent people from doing something to you that you don't want done to you. Right? You're immune, as it were, from all kinds of uh, torture or being forced to do things you don't want to do. The paradigm case of an immunity right uh, for Hofeld, and this is an interesting point because it makes you wonder, can animals really claim this, is the state cannot force you to believe in a certain religion. You were in, in the United States, right, where, where we have a, a kind of separation of church and state, right, uh, that, that you cannot be forced to believe in a certain religion. You have immunity, as it were, from a, a state-based church. Okay, that's his example of immunity, right? And that's the thing that's going to be claimed for animals. Now, claim right is the right in, in, the, in the more robust sense that I think many of us think about it, namely rights uh, incur reciprocal obligations, right? If, you know, uh, and it's a product of a contract relation, okay? Um, now, in Republican democracies of the kind that Hofeld was analyzing, all the different aspects of the right go together in constituting the autonomous person who is eligible to be a citizen in that society. Okay, that is the context in which this notion, so it's a very high standard, a very high bar that is being placed here and that not even all members of Homo sapiens immediately uh, would, uh, would meet it. And it doesn't have to, and the reason for that doesn't have to do that, you know, that um, people aren't biologic, you know, that, that certain individuals aren't biologically right or something. It's being able to satisfy certain properties of self-assertion, autonomy, rationality, things of that kind. Certain, now, you might say, well, this is not a good basis for doing these things, but that's, in fact, what the benchmark has been. And that's why, to go to the other side of the issue, right, why this kind of opens the door, in a way, to non-biological forms of personhood. Right? So machines and androids and things like that, who may actually have the requisite level of intellectual complexity uh, and rationality and self-assertion and so forth, even though they don't share any of the evolutionary heritage, even though they don't maybe even share many of the feelings 
many of the forms of sentience, in a sense, that's not really ever what was at issue there, right? What was at issue was these kind of higher, you might call higher order properties. And these were, in fact, thought to be the very properties that separated out human beings from brutes. So indeed, this is the case. It is the case, as was mentioned in the first couple of talks this morning, that in a sense, all of this rights talks, all this person's talk, is kind of a conspiracy against animals. It is. It is. Historically, it certainly is. Right? And, and there's a sense in which um, you know, people who want to really push this kind of animal rights stuff have to realize that you've got all the history against you, in a sense. And that, in fact, the door may be eas more widely opened for the machines. Okay, because in a sense, all of these other issues that have been brought up by the animals, about their, they, they, they feel pain, they suffer, all the rest of it, the, that, that legal status of that is much more up in the air and certainly not part of the history that's been involved in developing our notions of personhood and rights, which is much more tied to more abstract notions of autonomy and self-direction. Okay, so a cybernetic system, in some sense, might become a person in this respect. Okay, I, and so I, how, do I have any more time or am I just totally over time? Three more minutes. Sorry, I'm sorry, because I do want to open this up to questions. But I do think that for someone like myself, looking at this from the standpoint of the long view of history, um, I don't want to deny that we are you know, members of Homo sapiens, or that we have had this enormously long uh, evolutionary heritage. And so there is this whole kind of genealogical um, kind of continuity with the rest of the animal and plant kingdom and so forth. Do not deny this at all. Uh, but, I do, but, but one of the things that I am very much taken by is a, is a point uh, that Julian Huxley, who is one of the founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis made, he's the one who's normally credited with coining the term transhumanism, but he was also uh, you know, the founder of the modern evolutionary synthesis in the 1940s. And he was very much interested in reasserting human exceptionalism despite Darwin. Because right? as you know, Darwin flattens the distinction, and I, think, and I think Peter Singer and all the rest of you who've been invoking Darwin's name are absolutely right to do so in terms of, as it were, leveling the playing field in terms of the ontological difference between human beings and other animals. For sure, Darwin was doing that. Okay? Um, but uh, what Huxley said, because he wanted to reassert human exceptionalism, um, was that human beings are really the, uh, they're the only creature, or at least the first creature, to actually figure out evolutionary theory. Okay, so in other words, you know, all the other creatures that survive, as it were, have mastered it, you might say, in practice by being able to adapt to environments and continue to reproduce, but it's the human beings, the ones who have the second order knowledge, right, that enables them to understand the whole th system through which all this stuff happens. And this then brings about responsibilities, and, and, and I heard there was a big argument just before we started about stewardship, right, and stewardship comes into play at this point. Right, that human beings, in a sense, do have a special stewardship capacity by virtue of this second order cognitive superiority over the rest of nature. Okay? And then the question becomes, what do you do with that? Okay? And, and, um, and Huxley's own view, and this is the view that has really played out, I think, very significantly in the transhumanist movement, has been that you give evolution a direction it previously did not have. So he was a supporter of eugenics, for example. Okay? Um, and, and of course, all of the stuff about human enhancement that we see happening nowadays under the rubric of transhumanism, this is a kind of, you know, second, third generation version of this kind of thinking, okay? But the point is, there's always, you know, you might say the take home message from what I'm saying is, there's always been this kind of openness um, with regard to the relationship between the human and the biological species Homo sapiens. Okay, so it's not that, as it were, if you, if you believe in a strong idea of the human, you're necessarily going to you know, include all homo sapiens in it. You might actually leave a lot of them out, and you might be thinking about what the next stage is, where you can even leave more of them out. Okay, uh, and, and, and so, no, and I think this is, a, you know, from the standpoint of where one wants to take the politics and the law of this, one you know, needs to keep this in mind, that this is kind of a, a, another way of thinking about the matter. And, and I'll, I'll stop here, because I want to get a few questions in, if possible. Thank you. Yeah.